it was a disaster that stunned the nation. Within two minutes, 150 excited partygoers had been pitched into the black, icy waters of the Thames. Immediately, the water came gushing through. There was no way, to my mind, that there weren't going to be fatalities. How 51 people could be killed in the middle of the nation's capital on a calm summer's evening mystified relatives and survivors. Everybody was in such a state of shock, they didn't know what to do, what to think or what to say. My reaction is the same as everyone else's, young people. A tragedy, really, of the first order. But only days after the tragedy, worse was to come for the relatives of the victims. It was an insult that they cut his hands off in death. It was an indignity. One of the, the tabloids started to report it in quite a sort of negative way. The legacy of the Marchioness tragedy and the treatment of those affected by that terrible night still resonates today. In the early hours of the 20th of August, 1989, 51 people drowned when the Bow Bell, a huge sand dredger, collided with the Marchioness, a pleasure boat filled with partygoers enjoying a cruise on the Thames. After years battling for the truth, relatives were told their loved ones had been unlawfully killed, but that no one would be prosecuted. Their frustration is still evident today. It's referred to as an unlawful killing. That's a legal term, but I think it's accurate. I think a crime did occur that night, and I know to this day who I blame for that. If you're going to call something a crime, you'd have to define that word and what that word means. That word will mean different things for different people. Nobody was responsible. Really? Unlawful killing means that there is a case to answer. A terrible accident happened, and the crime was the way in which it was handled. In the summer of 1989, Jonathan Pang, the owner of a photographic agency in London, was organizing a birthday party for one of his friends. The party on board the Marchioness was organized for my best friend at the time, who'd been a long-standing great friend called Antonio de Vasconcelos, and it was his 26th birthday. And, um, you know, we were used to having great parties. We lived in the center of London. We were a close-knit but a widespread big circle of friends, you know. So Antonio wanted to organize a party that was slightly different to the average ones that we were having. So he came up with the idea of having it on a boat, which filled me with absolute horror, to be frank, because I've never been that fond of boats, and I also thought, you know, if people aren't enjoying it, they're kind of slightly numbered with it all night. So we went to see the Marchioness a few weeks beforehand, and I didn't like it because it looked and smelt like a floating pub. I expected it to be a bit more glamorous, and so I wasn't that enthused by it, but it was what he wanted. Everyone seemed to be excited about it. I wasn't, but I think most people were because they weren't very common in those days. The night celebrations began with a dinner party before the group met up with more friends and headed towards the Thames. I just remember looking in the water and there was all of this rubbish floating around. And I thought, I actually said to one of the fellow guests, to Roger, can you imagine what it would be like floating around, surrounded by all that dirt and rubbish? And that's what struck me about how filthy the river was just prior to getting onto the boat. I had never been on a party boat on the Thames, so it was all a bit new to me. It was a small boat, I think it dated back to the 1920s, with, I think, two levels to it. So you could go in and onto the boat and you could walk down some stairs to a kind of lower level. And then there was a level above that, sort of at the back of the boat, with more tables and chairs. It's probably me that said, I said, gosh, that's not the biggest boat in the world, is it? Um, and uh, we, in fact, we, I don't think we could see out of the embankment because the tide was quite low. The gangplank was at a, quite a steep angle to go down and it was sort of bobbing around down there. And Jonathan was on the door and it was like, in you come, kind of thing. 
Andrew Sutton, suffering from the effects of a cold, headed to the front or bow of the boat with some friends, including his girlfriend Helen and photographer's assistant, Tony Lo Maniem. It was very cramped downstairs and I didn't want to be down there because it immediately got very hot. You know, even when there was just like maybe 10 or 15 people down there, it was just, I just felt I was already, already getting a bit feverish, so I wanted to be out in the air. So yeah, it was very, very narrow. That's the one thing I, I remember marking on and thinking how much it, it felt like that. And I think that spurned the conversation from Tony to me about, you know, how stable boats were and how he couldn't swim. And, you know, we were having this discussion about the whole thing and, you know, that uh, obviously is, has become a bit more poignant. Also on board was Sean Lockwood Croft, a 26-year-old who'd gone to the party with some friends. Always had a big smile right from the time we were babies. He was actually placid in nature and easygoing. Loved life to the full. He worked very hard, but he played hard as well. He's one of those people you get, you can walk into the room, a wicked sense of humour, and that got him by out of any any clowning would get him out of difficult situations that he might have incurred at school. Judy Wellington's 20-year-old son, Simon, an aspiring model, was also heading to the Thames for a night on the river. I had Simon when I was quite young, and he was really clever, really bright, and I find it hard to teach him things because he seemed almost the same age as me, and he was hilariously funny. He was great at drawing. I've still got some of his art, and he wrote music, and he played the bass. He enjoyed his life. He really lived his short life, partying, and just a natural artistic person, really. The Marchioness was built in 1923 and had a proud history, taking part in the rescue of British troops from Dunkirk in World War II. Despite her past, her current role as a pleasure boat left her with some shortcomings. The Marchioness was badly lacking in considerations of emergencies. If you go to a cinema, exit signs have always been posted, and there should have been some form of exit signs and exits from the Marchioness. Some of the windows were sliding windows of perspex, and you could push one out as the supposed emergency escape. But when you get some damage, or distortion, the perspex jams in its frame, and it's not quite so easy. And it wasn't very clear which windows were the emergency ones. Around 1.20 a.m., the Marchioness left her mooring at Charing Cross Pier. The birthday party cruise had begun. It was a very relaxed, celebratory evening. I mean, it was, Antonio, it was for Antonio's birthday, and he was a very social guy. He was a very, he was a popular, a popular person. He was very charismatic, and Jonathan Pang was a very charismatic person. So they had, I think they always created parties that were highly charged and a lot of fun. I think that's why people went, because they knew they would have a good time. So yeah, I think, I think everyone was in a good mood, everyone was relaxed. So then the boat set off, and um, I felt even more relieved, and I then started having a good time, and started socialising and getting people drinks and serving food. And I thought, well, this is going to be all right, actually. You know, everyone was in a great mood. People started dancing straight away. Uh, and Antonio was happy, and I think that sort of meant the world to me. I think that there was, you know, a general sense that it was going to be fun. I myself did have some strange weird thought as I was on the bow of the boat when I did say to my girlfriend, oh, I wonder what it'd be like to swim in that water tonight. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? That may sound ridiculous, but actually, it did actually happen. Unbeknownst to the passengers, as the cruise got underway, the potential for a serious incident was already present. When the birthday party passengers arrived, there was no checking of the people on board, no count of numbers. The passage down river, she wasn't keeping well to one side. There was no lookout behind and no radio awareness. Only minutes into the cruise, the passengers on the Marchioness began to get a sense something was very wrong. 
just prior to the collision, I was in the lower part of the boat, and I actually got up to go and get some drinks. So I was walking down the kind of the middle aisle, and so I was standing, and I looked out to one side, and there was a sort of reasonable jolt. All of a sudden, I thought, hold on a sec, we've, we've, we've bumped into something. And then nothing happened for maybe, I don't know, a couple of seconds. And then there was a much bigger blow. And I just instinctively knew that something large had hit us. In the early hours of the 20th of August, 1989, the Marchioness, a Thames pleasure craft, had set off for a birthday party cruise down the river with 130 people on board. Only minutes into the cruise, disaster struck as the small craft was mowed down by another much larger vessel, the Bow Bell. The Bow Bell was designed as an aggregate dredger. She'd go out to the banks just outside the Thames and with a suction pipe would suck up the sand and gravel. Once the gravel was on board, it passed through a grading plant, a large piece of machinery on the deck of the boat that obscured forward view from the bridge. This reduced visibility created a blind spot in front of the bow bell. Any boats in front of her would be very hard to see by the person steering. This situation was compounded by the fact that the rear of the boat was sitting too low in the water, meaning the blind spot in front was larger than normal. And when they looked from the bridge, they could not see the water ahead for over 400 meters. And she should never been on, have been on the river on that basis. The Bow Bell left her moorings at Nine Elms near Battersea on the Thames just after 10 past one in the morning. The captain and several other crew were on the bridge with two other crewmen at the front of the ship, one of whom was supposedly charged with keeping a lookout. Crucially, the lookout had no available means of contacting the bridge other than by shouting. The Bow Bell was a huge vessel, over 80 meters in length, three times the size of the Marchioness. As she continued along the Thames, both craft were minutes from disaster. So I just remember you know, going round to see if everyone was OK. Going down to the basement, chatting with the people that I worked with, going upstairs, introducing people to each other. And um, I went to the bar and I hadn't even had a drink yet. And then my friend Tim just turned to me and grabbed my arm and said, look over there. And then we just saw this huge vessel coming towards us. And um, so I just sort of thought to myself, well, it can't possibly hit us. The bow bell was overtaking. The Marchioness. Normally a straightforward manoeuvre and you'd, one would expect the Marchioness to keep clear of the mid-channel and certainly she must have done if she'd listened to the announcements which she failed to do and wasn't really aware of the bow bell coming down. Some blame must go on the noise of the disco which was immediately next door to the wheelhouse. The progress of the Bow Bell along the Thames was recorded in a series of radio broadcasts. For whatever reason, the Marchioness seemed not to hear these announcements and headed for the centre arch on Southwark Bridge. Both vessels were on a collision course and incredibly, both were unaware of each other's positions. The first contact was the starboard bow of the Bow Bell probably 10 feet, 12 feet above the water. It was getting closer and closer. I took my glasses off and I vividly remember thinking to myself, well, if something does happen, I don't want to be blind. And I thought, you know, if the boat crashes into us and my glasses break into my eyes, I won't have my sight. So I took my glasses off and at that point, the bow bell hit the boat. And on the second blow, there was a lot of screaming. It was just a splintering of wood, the sound of the really intense, sharp crackling of wood, and the whole floor just disappearing from, from underneath your feet. I didn't immediately feel scared. In fact, I looked over to where my girlfriend was sitting and some other friends, and I actually said out loud, oh no, here we go. 
which may sound ridiculous, but actually what it, I meant was, oh no, here we go, we're going to capsize. I just grabbed Helen to my right because you know, Tony just wasn't there. Um, you know, he was, he, he was holding onto that other rail, which had completely gone under the water. And I just swung her around like that and said, you know, we, we, we have to go in. And as we went over, the boat was knocked from being in its balanced position, obviously out towards its side. All the windows were open along both sides of the boat. So the side of the boat that went down towards the water, just immediately the water came gushing through. And the fact that the window started bursting, I just sort of knew that it was going to be horrendous. There was no way, to my mind, that, um, that there weren't going to be fatalities. There was no way at all. I myself just closed my eyes and let it happen. I knew we were going to go over. I knew it was going to happen. And I kind of relaxed into it. As the bow bell carried on along the river, it pushed the marchioness onto her side ripping off the top cabin and shattering windows. As water rushed in, she began to sink. The boat filled up with water, basically straight away. Everyone who was inside the boat was inside a boat that was going onto its side and was entirely full of water and was, I presume, partially sinking. So there was really no way to know where, where to go or what to do. The People on the bar deck, because the roof had gone, would have naturally gone into the water. The people in the dining room may have got a few of them out if they smashed a window, or they'd have to go up the half flight of steps into the disco deck. The toilets were each side of that pair of steps, and I think there was somebody in certainly one of the toilets who realistically had no chance to get out because of the time. When I was underwater, there was something trapping me. Um, there was something on my chest that was hurting like hell. And I remember being underwater and very consciously making the decision, I'm in such pain with this thing that's on my chest that actually, if I open my mouth and drown, it may not be quite as painful. And then, as luck would have it, whatever it was that was trapping me, started to lift, but then I heard the t this awful noise of the propellers of the, uh, of the bow bow, and then I started getting really scared. Prior to that, I was kind of calm, and I suppose in shock, but I heard this terrible, really, really loud noise. I thought, oh no, I do not want my last memory to be of me being mashed in a propeller. And that's when I had a bit of sort of fight to try and get away from it. And then, luckily enough for me, I presume the boat went over and I bobbed up. Those in the disco deck had the two forward doors to pass through. Those doors were hooked open and had been the cause of all the noise to the skipper in the wheelhouse but many got out through that. But it's all made it seemingly difficult because she was lying on her side. And even in a room, if it suddenly turned through 90 degrees, it would take a lot of intelligence and clear thinking to realize how to open the door. Andrew Sutton also found himself on the surface, holding on to his girlfriend, but seemingly trapped by something under the water. I realized that it wasn't, I wasn't caught, it was, it, was, it was a hand sort of just basically holding my ankle. And you know, I, I, I sort of like, I, I think I just put my head straight down into the water to sort of try and, I mean, to realise, you know, I could feel this gripping and to put me down and, 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 and I could see, and suddenly I, I had Tony's face in my face and, 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 and a hand here and a hand there and I didn't, I didn't have any other way of being able to support myself and I had like two people, one on each arm. Uh, and that was, um, yeah, that, that, that becomes a source of frustration, you know, in, in retrospect. Just seeing his face, because you know, it was so recognisable, you know, he had so much hair, but it, it, it became, it, it's become exaggerated over time. It's like this face underwater with, with lots of hair swirling round and sort of, you know, bulging eyes, and it's like, you know, I mean, we, we were probably, you know, this far away from each other face to face because, you know, there's no visibility in the Thames, even, even in midday, right? So we were very close, and it was... 
you know, there was a hand there and he, he, he was so close to, 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 to coming out. I could, I could sense that we had to move very quickly and within, I mean, nanoseconds, you know, I mean, that, that, that shaking, that shaking for him, he was, he was gone. Roger Fife had also reached the surface when a dawning realisation hit him. The fantasy could be that I think I was the last person to get out and that has some meaning. The reality is that I turned around once I was on the surface of the water. I looked around and I saw the very last bit of the stern of the Marchioness going under. The very last part. Um, just like you would imagine one of those movies that we've all probably seen. Uh, a disaster movie. And as the stern was going down, there was uh, some, some bubbles coming up and a, and a lot of movement of the water, a lot of sucking. And I looked around and there was nobody else, as close as I was. And I did look around in the other direction, further away from the boat, and there were people dotted around in the water, people holding on to beer kegs, people holding on to bits of the boat, people trying to tread water. But there was nobody right beside me, and there was nobody either exiting at that moment or directly beside the boat. So that's why I've made that assumption to myself that maybe I was one of the very last people to get out. Some of the survivors were picked up by police launches, whilst many more were collected by the Marchioness's sister ship, the Hurlingham. People on the Hurlingham are a bit sort of the unsung heroes because nobody really ever mentions them, but they saved a lot of lives. And, you know, it was a funny experience getting on it because, of course, they were having a great party. It was a much bigger boat than the Marchioness. There were lots of people on it. And I remember being pulled through a window, which was not easy, let me tell you. They were sort of yanking me through this window. Um, and they were all in a state of shock, thinking, oh, God, you know, this could be us. And everyone was sort of pulling survivors through the windows, and then the skipper's like, don't all run to that side, because we could capsize. All the weight was going over there. Everybody was in such a state of shock, they didn't know what to do, what to think, or what to say. As the search and rescue operations slowly swung into action, the survivors were taken to hospital, unaware that the trauma caused by the Marchioness and its tragic legacy was only just beginning. Fifty-one people died when the dredger Bow Bell collided with and sank the pleasure boat Marchioness in the summer of 1989. Nearby, the search for bodies continued, police systematically sweeping the waters. Well, in my experience on the river, Old Father Thames always surrenders its dead. It was one of the worst tragedies the River Thames had ever seen. For the relatives and survivors, however, the treatment they would receive by the authorities and the media would only worsen their grief. It baffles me, it really does. I mean, I think it baffles anyone to think that you could have, you know, so many deaths in central London and it be not necessarily forgotten about, but so just so brushed aside, you know. I mean, in many respects, that's how, that's how I survived, as being by brushed aside. But there is that lingering feeling that that's what the Marchioness disaster has been treated like something just to be brushed aside now. Once on dry land, some survivors were taken to hospital to be examined, with many discharged after only a few hours. Some reached the sides of the river and in a state of shock, simply walked home. It was that, that swift, you know, one minute you're, you're in the middle of a thing like that where, you know, now, so many people died, and the next minute you're sitting at home wondering where the hell everybody else is, and, you know, I mean, this is the days before we had mobile phones. At the hospital, when people we knew came up and said, have you seen, have you seen so-and-so, have you seen so-and-so? And the worst one of all being that at least two young women came up and were hysterical and said, have you seen their partner, their boyfriend. And in that moment, the penny dropped. I was like, these people are dead. These people are dead. And this is actually a lot more serious than I realized. 11 hours after the collision that claimed so many lives, the helicopters are still carrying out their grim search for victims of this tragedy. Across the country, 
friends and relatives were waking to the news of the tragedy. At home, Margaret Lockwood Croft was with her husband when a news flash was broadcast. There was this news about this disaster in London. And my, then I went down and I said, that's rather sh near to where Sean is. I said, I know, it's something that, oh, he said, oh, you're panicking. I said, well, I'm going to phone and, and see if he's all right. So I phoned, but it was his recording. No, no one answered. So I left a message saying, um, hello, number one and only. I said, let mother know that you're all right. I just had this funny feeling at the pit of my stomach, as, um, and so I just didn't feel right. I felt there was something wrong. It was on the morning that I got a phone call from one of his friends to say, Judy, can you call the hospital because Simon was on the boat? And I'd heard the news in the morning, but you just don't associate that you're ever going to know anyone in a situation like that. So from that point, I, I just had this really horrible feeling and it was just desperately trying to ring all the numbers that they were giving on the news so it was just through his friends that said uh, things so i said well where was he? he said he was on the dance floor margaret lockwood craft headed to london in an attempt to find out more about what had happened to her son a police officer came out and i went in and they started filling out this form, asking me all these, you know, height and colour, doctor, dentist, all these things about him. And his last question was, what funeral director are you going to use? And that was the official way I was told, your son is dead. And I just sat there saying, you're telling me Sean's dead, you're telling me Sean's dead. This shocking news would mark the start of a 25-year battle for the relatives and survivors of the tragedy. We were just waiting every day, and I would just pray that we would find a body, because the worst thing was not finding the body. When they did find his body, they found him and Sean together. And uh, Margaret said that Sean had a flat near Tower Hill, so she thinks that they were swimming. When I look back at it, it is, it's a mad loss. It is a mad loss. I really do feel like my soulmate, my brethren, my friend, you know, somebody I could turn to, he always used to call me kid. Directly after the Marshness was sunk, of course, the media did get on board with reporting it. And for the first maybe day, maybe two days tops, it was quite factual or intent to be factual. And then one of the, the tabloids started to report it in quite a sort of negative way. The Evening Standard really wrote a horrible headline about a few less cowboy boots on the King's Road, a few less GTIs few less filofaxes. You know, you remember those things because you think, well, you know, my son was just an ordinary kid. He's only 20. There was a strange idea that this event had befallen people who had somehow invited it upon themselves. These young people were flying too high, too close to the sun. They kind of had it coming that they were young, they were parting too hard. They were yuppies. They were yuppies filled full of cocaine who drank copious amounts of champagne. So let's not feel too sorry for them. I mean, to be honest with you, I had 20 years of paranoia as a result of it. And there were so many things that would sort of send it. I remember going into a pub and this guy saying to me, who I'd been fairly, you know, not friendly with, but I would always, you know, acknowledge and say hi to. And he said, well, I hope you've enjoyed your 15 minutes of fame. I think the surprise that that could take place, that reaction was, it was shocking. It was shocking for me, it was shocking for my fellow survivors. As if the treatment by the press wasn't enough to cope with, survivors and relatives began to be aware that the authorities' response was less than sympathetic. My current wife, Rachel, was, was, was Chris's good friend as well, and 
she was asked to go up to Ipswich to, 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 to break the news to, his, to, to, to Chris's mother, which, you know, you, that would not happen in this day and age. You wouldn't ask somebody who's just a mate to pop up and tell your, tell, can you tell your mate's uh, mum that uh, their, you know, their only son has died? Yeah, that's, it, 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 it is a terrible wrongdoing. Before going to the crash scene, the Prime Minister, who flew back from holiday today, spent over an hour at Scotland Yard, being briefed about two of the investigations now underway. Well, there were some things that took place directly afterwards. I think there was, clearly there was some attempt to try and get the thing processed as quickly as possible because a lot of people didn't like this thing landing in their lap. Well, oh, you're responsible for it. You need to explain what happened. We need to have an inquiry. A lot of people didn't want to deal with that, so I think they wanted to just process it, shove it through, and get it done with. Obviously, didn't sit well with some survivors and some relatives. To compound their anguish, relatives were refused access to the remains of their loved ones, and there were even suggestions that the wrong bodies were returned to some grieving families. Incredibly, worse was to come. Years after the tragedy, it emerged that internal organs and hands had been removed from the deceased without relatives' permission. We were told for identification purposes, which again to me was idiotic. Sean had all the information required in his wallet, credit cards, bank details, um, car keys, other ID, a lot of the others, too, as they worked in London, had their company ID cards on them. So you could identify clearly by that. I don't even want to get into the whole reason hands were cut off, because that is criminal to me. Imagine you lose your child, and then you're told you're not allowed to identify them because for some inexplicable reason, um, someone's decided that the hand should be cut off to identify the body. Why does it have to be cut off to, do, to be identified from fingerprints? Now, that is a massive embarrassment to this country. And to me, it's a criminal act. Simon's hands meant a lot to him because he was an artist and a bass player. And it was an insult that they cut his hands off in death, it was an indignity and an insult. And I forgive everything, but I don't forget what they did to my son. Why cut off his hands? Why cut off people's hands, you know? As part of the legal process, those affected could apply for compensation. Again, though, there was further evidence of a lack of sympathy with many relatives having to supply receipts for clothing worn by the dead. The whole thing was dispensed with in such a kind of a matter-of-fact way. OK, both owners of the, both the Marchioness and the Mobile, we accept liability, but in order to prove that you've been affected by the loss of your child, you need to have a psychiatrist to say that you've suffered post-traumatic stress disorder. So those are the kind of things that you think, well, Let's hope that humanity's moved on a bit since that time and that naturally you would have been affected by that loss. The years following the disaster would see inquests, inquiries and a trial. But despite all these, relatives and survivors would be left asking what exactly happened that night on the Thames and who was at fault. When the Marchioness sank in August 1989, after being struck by the dredger Bow Bell, 51 people drowned. How so many lives could be lost in the middle of London on a calm summer's evening confounded relatives and survivors. People were treated as criminals. I think the fact that so many people haven't been able to move on with their lives um, is a testimony to that. You know, it was almost like um, it was a crime to go out and enjoy yourself or to be able to afford to have a private party, or to be rich, or to be comfortable, or to be talented. It was almost a crime that you got together to do that. 
In 1991, the captain of the Bobel was acquitted of failing to keep a proper lookout after two juries failed to reach a verdict. Once again, the relatives were left waiting for answers. I've got a clean driving license, but if I drove and I hurt someone and caused a death, I should expect to go to prison. But if you kill 51 people, how do you get a slap on the wrist? 51 people died. It was a noisy frustration for the families. And again, I said there was swell of accusations and anger with the, the, with the, the, the bereaved families and, and with survivors, because it was a travesty. But again, being the only one that sat and read all the documents and things, you could see why there was a travesty and why juries, because they weren't given the facts. Witnesses, particular witnesses, had been withdrawn. And that would have made a great deal of difference. A month later, in August 1991, the Marine Accident Investigation Bureau report into the disaster was published. For relatives demanding answers, the report contained little in the way of resolution. I sense that now that people thought it was important to cover stuff up. You know, I don't know if they could get away with it now. You'd like to think that they can't. But we were just baffled with science. I had that report and, you know, I just looked at it, looked through it and I thought, blah, 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 blah. You know, it just didn't tell me why Simon died. I'm not pointing blame because I don't think it's helpful or useful. My anger is targeted against the people who decided that the hand should be cut off and the press that felt that it was a sensational thing to write about without thinking about people's feelings. Finally, in 1995, six years after the disaster, the relatives and survivors felt a sense that their demands for the truth had been listened to. An inquest jury stated that the 51 people that drowned on the Marchioness had been unlawfully killed. A year later, the Crown Prosecution Service stated that any new prosecutions were unlikely to be successful. Although not a crime in the legal sense, what happened to the Marchioness provokes outrage from the relatives of the deceased. The evidence that's always been available was never ever used all the witnesses available that should have been called were never called so that is still a travesty there was plenty of evidence that they were not going to use for whatever political reason or whatever gender they had there they weren't going to use it there should be a natural correlation between unlawful killing unlawful the word itself says unlawful killing, then how come there's no case to answer? In 2001, survivors and relatives finally reached some semblance of closure after a public inquiry that had taken over 11 years of continuous campaigning to enact delivered its report. It blamed the disaster on both vessels, claiming they had failed to keep a proper lookout. The report also confirmed that the captain of the Bobel had drunk several pints of beer on the afternoon of the disaster. And while it stated the alcohol had left his bloodstream by the time of the collision, his conduct was called into question. There was no mayday signal given, and none of the crew of the Bobel deployed life rafts, despite being aware of people in the water. But what have they got to hide? What was it that they had to hide? Or was it bureaucracy? I still don't know what they had to hide. The accident happened. The tragedy was the way we were treated. Why? Why did they feel that they had to hide everything from us? At the inquiry, then things were unraveled in a way that people needed to know. You know, you kind of feel your heart moving slowly back into place. The victims are not just the dead, 
you know, the victims of the survivors and their families. When somebody dies, it affects a lot of people. And, um, you know, I do think that answers are the first step to the grieving process. In so many ways, you just want to know. And I think where this whole thing um, with the public inquiry was criminal to take 12 years to get the public inquiry. OK, it doesn't solve anything, it doesn't change anything, but it gives you some kind of satisfaction that somebody cares about it and you can then start moving on and start your grieving. Since the tragedy, largely down to the work of the campaigners, a whole host of improvements have been made to river safety on the Thames, including 43 new laws, more effective radio communications, as well as CCTV and lighting. Safety improvements since the Marchioness tragedy mean that all passenger vessels now have illuminated bows and brightly lit orange panels on their stern. Changes have also been made to the way the authorities react to similar disasters. The Marchioness tragedy also served as a reference for the criminal act of corporate manslaughter that came into effect in 2007. You sometimes think, what have I really achieved with all this <laughs> nagging and uh, campaigning? But I think the Marchioness action, which has been done, everything I've done is done for the families and survivors because I'm very conscious my emotions and my feelings and, uh, of my son, and I know other families feel the same of their loved ones. And I think at the end of the day, and with the lifeboats particularly, we've left positive legacies behind. As a direct result of the disaster, there are now four lifeboat stations operating on the Thames. They are the busiest lifeboats out of all their stations around the coast, the number of shouts they get and the number of lives that have been saved. And um, we have received letters from families thanking us because they, the R and I have said, well, if it wasn't for the Marshall Action Group, they wouldn't be here. Um, so we're, we're very proud of that. The Bow Bell was later sold to a Portuguese company, but sank off the island of Madeira in 1996. In 2009, 20 years after the collision, Andrew Sutton dived the wreck of the ship that had almost killed him. I got down and I was scrubbing away at the, at the back of the boat and, and it, 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 the paint just came off and Bow Bell got revealed a name and it was sort of still the name Bow Bell after all these years. You know, it's just a little bit of, you know, rust and sedimentation and a bit of growth on there. And um, it was, it was it, I mean, that was, that was like somebody sort of giving you a kick in the stomach. So to see it, you know, it's like, you know, the last time I'd seen that was like sitting in the Thames, you know, sort of shouting obscenities at it. To sit literally in the sand in front of it and look up and, you know, force it out of your system. It was, it was like a forcing, you know, I will rid you from my mind. In the 25 years since the Marchioness disaster, relatives and survivors have all dealt with their experiences in very different ways. All said and done, I don't think that there is a positive legacy from the Marchioness. I really don't see what, other than a few more lifeboats. I think the whole situation is aggressible. I don't think that it's um, enhanced people's life. I think it's created problems for people. I am not a negative person and I enjoy my life. I do feel that maybe my life was put on hold and I am absolutely trying to make up for it now. I love life, I love living, I love people, and I like experience, and I want as many experiences as I possibly can before I die. Individually, I think we've, most people have kind of got on with things, and, 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 and you know, we still carry our, 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 our sadness with us. Um, and I mean, um, I swim every morning, and I literally reel off you know, the names of my dead friends every time I get in the pool. That's what I do, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my way of still dealing with it now. Because I don't want to forget them, because I don't think it's right to forget them. And I think that's the crime, I think the way that people, the, the way we, we've, we were treated, everybody was treated, absolutely everybody. It's interesting because I, I do go past the South Bank quite a lot. I look at the Thames quite a lot and I love the Thames. I actually, I really love the Thames. 
I think it's a beautiful river and I really enjoy it. I like looking at it. I go along sometimes it's low tide and high tide. I'll go and cross one of the bridges and stand looking down the water and I'll enjoy it in all its magnificence. At the same time, I'll also think it's quite interesting that that's a place I almost died.